Welcome back, America 2 here at Live from Studio West. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart, and I am very lucky that Sarah Westwood agreed to make her first appearance today. Sarah is a political investigative reporter with the Washington Examiner. Hello, Sarah. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Uh, first of all, would you tell people a little bit about yourself, your Twitter handle and your background, because I want people to get used to seeing Sarah because we want to monopolize her time. She's one of the ace reporters up on the Hill. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, I am a political reporter for the Washington Examiner. You can find me on Twitter at Sarah C. Westwood. Uh, and I am a CNN alumni. So take from that what you will as well. Well, so am I. You know, we all go to our various networks. But Sarah, you report on the Hill and I want to go to what you hear happened overnight. Did anything move? You know, it's really hard to see what leverage McCarthy has at this point. I mean, his maximum amount of leverage was on that first ballot. And every time it heads to a vote again, his ability to sort of horse trade and, you know, the value of the concessions that he's making diminishes. So at this point, you know, there there is no other clear candidate to take up the mantle. None has really emerged that Republicans can coalesce around. But McCarthy's leverage is shrinking every hour that goes by that he's not given the gavel. You know, Sarah, I'm going to I'm going to argue a little bit with you on that, because I think I, I, I put the number at 50 to Congressman Gallagher early uh, earlier today. I think there are 50 dead enders for Kevin, only Kevin. And he said that's the the floor. There are more than that. If that is, in fact, true, then no one gets elected except Kevin McCarthy. So I don't. I don't know that he can increase his leverage. I just think it's a question of no house versus a house. Uh, and people like Juan Siscomani, who were just on, they're not even getting paid. These freshmen are not even getting paid or health, uh, health insurance or staff for that matter. Right. I think the one issue here, though, is that for some of these conservatives who are never Kevin's, on the opposite end of that spectrum that you're talking about, it seems like it's become personal more than about any other policy changes because McCarthy is caving left and right on on things that leadership had no intention of giving to conservatives. And you know, for, for some, it seems like the goalposts keep moving. Right, first it was that you know they wanted more influence on committees and 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 they wanted you know the, the amendment process to be changed so that members, rank and file members, would have more say over legislation. Now, you know, they're blaming it on the fact that McCarthy supported the omnibus and big spending bills in the past, you know? And so how do you solve the problem of members whose lack of trust in McCarthy runs so deep that they're willing to use any excuse not to support him when his margins are so thin? Well, I don't think you're gonna change people except by political pressure. Now, Donald Trump came out this morning and said, it's time for everyone to vote for Kevin McCarthy. So the president has again, the former president has again put his full faith and credit behind McCarthy. Does that move even one vote? It's hard to see how, because, you know, the people who might be most swayed by Donald Trump's support uh, are, or, or Donald Trump's opinion and advice are, are sort of already in the never Kevin camp or are very pro Kevin, right? Like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's very closely associated with Donald Trump and has backed his speakership. The people in the middle right now, fence sitters who could go either way, may not necessarily be that influenced by Donald Trump. I think a, a one significant development that may be indicative of a problem that McCarthy might have is what Congressman Byron Donalds from Florida said when he switched his vote to a no, saying he pointed to the process. He wasn't necessarily not supportive of Kevin McCarthy, but said, you know, these successive votes, they're not helping anyone. So some of those fence sitters who are maybe lukewarm supporters of McCarthy could at some point blame the process for, you know, withholding their support from McCarthy on these successive votes and try to push him to get out of the race so they can clean this up quickly. You know, uh, Charles Gordon is the name from the past. He went to Khartoum and refused to surrender it to the Mahdi, and he was eventually overwhelmed by the modest because the relief house didn't get there in, I think, 1883. I don't think Kevin is ever going to stand down because he, he stood down once before for this day. And I don't think they're ever, I think the house may end up unorganized for months. Does the political cost of these 20, and I, I referenced Selena Zito, who was on in the first hour today, she went to the 10th congressional district in Pennsylvania yesterday, Scott Perry's district, and a lot of Republicans there are mad at Scott Perry. You don't win any Democrats by doing this. You do lose Republicans by doing this. Do you think that pressure will build on the 20? I think it will, but what does Sarah Westwood think? 
I think the pressure will build both ways, right? I mean, at some point, if the math just isn't there for McCarthy, if they're unwilling to budge and, you know, are, are confident that their most ardent supporters in these deeply red districts are going to stick with them and maybe not necessarily hold them accountable two years after they're doing this, maybe they won't back down. But the pressure on McCarthy could start to build as well if if it's clear that he has no path to the gavel, but he continues to hold out and he just hopes that he'll sort of wear down his opposition when they've clearly indicated they're willing to wait him out as well you know he could face a similar amount of pressure there no i think this is going on for weeks sarah either it resolves uh and i did today to the callers are you with the 200 or the 20 and i have i, I opened up two lines for each of them and i can get calls all day long for both of them but i think it's going to take a while i'm not in the beltway i won't be in the beltway i left the beltway for four months in California, people are laughing at the Republicans. I went to a college campus where I teach yesterday. They're just laughing at Republicans. I don't know that the Beltway quite has figured this out yet, how bad the Republicans look on the national stage. Do you, do you get a sense that they have? Because this is really a disaster for the Republicans. You know, if Kevin McCarthy, let's say, wins the speaker vote at noon today when the House comes back, I think this will be a blip. If this does go on for weeks, then it is a huge embarrassment. It's indicative of the Republican you know, fishers in the party that they don't have a lot of consensus around any one ideological direction right now. If they can't even pick a leader, you know, that says a lot about the state of the Republican Party and potentially why they didn't perform very well in the midterms. And so, you know, I think it really depends how quickly this gets resolved. Right now, for Kevin McCarthy, there's no reason to step aside because there's no real challenger. There's no one natural successor. And so him stepping aside right now could arguably lead to an even messier process. If you ask me that again in a week, you know, maybe the, the political calculations will be different. But McCarthy right now has no real incentive to leave the race until the momentum really starts to break away from him. I'm not sure that it has yet. Oh, I don't think it's going to. Uh, because if you give in to the hostage takers, they take more hostages. And so I, I just I don't think there's any incentive for any of the 200 to move. Uh, there might be a, you know, a immaculate reception of some sort that comes along that there's some deal has worked out that we haven't foreseen, but I don't think that's going to happen. Let me ask you this, Sarah. Has anyone proposed nominating in turn each of the 20 to see how many votes they get? Because I'd love to see how many people vote for Matt Gates. Now, I, the, the Gates gang is small. It's five or less. How many people do you think would actually vote for Matt Gates if he was nominated? Not very many. And, you know, Andy Biggs tried that during the, the the conference vote in November. You know, it's a sort of stalking horse challenge to indicate uh, the lack of support that McCarthy did have within the House GOP conference. He lost 31 votes there, but that wasn't anywhere near the sort of consensus that a challenger to McCarthy would need to have. The, the one problem he may have, and I don't know how likely this is because he does have a lot of loyal allies in the House, but an ambitious, popular congressman right now could see blood in the water, you know, and start to pitch his or herself as an alternative who could, you know, unite the Republican conference. There were whispers that, you know, is that what Jim Jordan is trying to do as as the, the 19 to 20 who are defecting sort of cast their votes for him? An ambitious congressman could right now try to step up. But I think the time to have done that was a few months ago. You know, McCarthy's looked weak for two months. And yet, yeah, you know, I, I think you're right to reference the bigs as the high water mark of the anti Kevins, the bigs conference yeah. vote. I thought it was 33. You're saying 31. I'll trust your reporting on that. But that was the high water mark. They're down to 20. This could go on for months. I really do think it's sort of like parties break up all the time. This could go on for months, but I just don't see any of the 200. Just tell me what they lose if it goes on, because Jim Jordan can't go back on this now because he he's on the record. I, I, he's not going to, I don't see him ever deserting Kevin McCarthy. I don't think he'd get judiciary. If it go, if they throw everything up in the air, all the conservative concessions will go away. Won't they? Well, what do the conservatives have? The, 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 the opposite question of that, I guess, to play devil's advocate. What do the conservatives have to lose by continuing to stand against McCarthy at this point? They're clearly not that worried about, at least at this moment, the perceptions that they're throwing a wrench in the party operations. That's kind of the point, right? They want to send a message that they're dissatisfied with the status quo and they want to have more influence over the legislative process. They don't seem all that concerned right now with how harsh the spotlight is on them. If if that doesn't change, you know, what is their incentive to back down as well? If McCarthy This is where the, the districts this is 
I don't know if the examiner will ever send you out to the 20 districts, but I think in the next few days we're going to get reports from each of these 20 districts and the margin of their victory. It's not about keeping their hardcore base. It's not even about keeping their donors. It's about keeping the 10% or the 1% that put them over the top. Lauren Boebert, for example, what she win by? 200 votes? Yeah, very, She's very D DWW, dead woman walking, uh, come 2024. Uh, I just think this is a basic electoral math that there are a lot of people like Hugh Hewitt. Uh, I'm a Republican. I've been a Republican for 60 years, you know, ever since I've been aware. I just am so angry that they've screwed up what was supposed to be a rollout of oversight that these 20 are digging a hole. And I don't know that that's getting through to the beltway. Have you heard any of that thus far? You know, I think there's a lot of private grumbling about the how bad this looks. But, you know, he McCarthy needs to whittle that down significantly, that 20, right? I mean, he can only lose, what, four Republicans, five Republicans. So some of those Republicans are in, you know, R plus double digits districts. They're not worried about, you know, a marginal amount of voters like Lauren Balbert, who would certainly have a different political calculation because her support is so thin within her district. But Republicans who, you know, blew just one by double digit percentage margins, you know, they might not necessarily be worried about losing a few, you know, moderate voters on the margins to send a message they've been waiting years to send. You know, even if you won by 10 percent, though, Sarah, I'm playing devil's advocate with you because you're you're tuned in. I want to hear what you know, hopefully you'll ask congressman this today. If you won by 10 percent, that means if you lose 5 percent, get disgusted with you. 5% say, I didn't know Scott Perry was crazy. 5% say, I, I didn't know, I got the list in front of me that Mary Miller was going to be a nut. Uh, they've lost. Do you, do you think they understand? This is really a bad look. This is the worst look I've ever seen the Republicans other than when they had to throw out Hastert. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think some of those conservative Republicans who are, sent, are arguing that the status quo needs to be completely shaken up are acting like voters sent Republicans some kind of mandate by giving them a four seat majority. That's not the message that voters sent, right? They, they don't want Republicans to come in and shake up the system entirely. So you're right that I don't think that sentiment is out there in the general electorate. But for some of those Republicans who are in really safe districts, they're also probably looking at the calendar and saying there's two years before I'll have to answer. Uh, by that time. Early voting starts tomorrow, I think. <laughs> Sarah Westwood, keep coming back. It's great to see you in person. Thank you for joining me.